Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first evening of Tanya Meditations. Why would somebody come to an evening called Tanya Meditations? What, what would somebody be looking for when uh, they see that there's a meditation based on Hasidic wisdom or any meditation or any spiritual evening? Why do people go to these things? What are they looking for? So usually, I think it's because we have problems and we want to find solutions to our problems. That's why we're attracted to spirituality. As it's often said, that uh, religion generally is a crutch. It's a crutch for people who are weak, who, people who have issues, who don't have clarity or don't have strength, inner strength. They can't stand up on their own. Their, their life is too much of a mess. They need a crutch. They need something to prop them up. So religion is something that uh, people chase after for that. I don't know if you know anyone who has problems, uh, but those who do tend to need a crutch. It's true. Uh, people, people need that. Um, when I hear that statement, when people say that, you know, religion is a crutch or it's just a you know, support, it's for the weak, it always reminds me of another statement. I can't remember which wise person said it, that reality is just an escape for people who can't handle drugs. <laughs> uh, have you heard of that one? Can you remember who said it? The guy who died. <laughs> <laughs> that comedian guy. Yeah? Robert Williams. Robert Williams, it was him? Could, could have been, I'm not sure. Um, which, you know, it's a, it's a very clever statement, but that's, that's exactly what it is. It's just, it's the inversion of, of, of reality. Like to say that it's, there are certain people who have problems, they need, they, they need a crutch. Who, who, who are we not talking about then? Who, who, are we, who are the people who don't need a crutch, who don't need any support, who don't need anything to hold them up, to encourage them, to inspire them, to get them through the day and the week and the year? Who are these people? Uh, I'd love to meet them. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see what their reality is, uh, but uh, so far I haven't, haven't, haven't met, met anyone. Uh, I, I certainly have many crutches. Uh, I can't get through the day without eating, without sleeping. I, they're, they're total things I'm dependent upon. Uh, I, uh, I need other people. I'm a very needy, weak person. That's, that's, what, that's what I am. I, I can't do it on my own. I don't have all the strength. I don't have all the power. I need nourishment. I need all types of things to get me through the day. So I'm one of those people who has problems and issues and weaknesses and a reality that I can't handle. And I need a crutch. Yeah, I do. Uh, physical ones to nourish me physically and spiritual ones to get me through and to, to inspire me. And so I guess that's, that's the type of person who would look for a meditation, who would look for some spiritual uplift for, for guidance, is the person who has problems, has issues, things they need to deal with, and can't do it on their own, which is everybody. And so what we're going to attempt to do tonight and in this series is extract some such crutches, let's call them that, or supports, or maybe a better word is tools, tools of how to, to face the type of issues that every single person goes through. and be on top, be able to, to cope and to, and to thrive and to grow. And the source we're going to use is the Book of Tanya, the great work of Hasidic thought, mystical Jewish philosophy, written in the 1700s, in the late 1700s, and still studied today as one of the most profound studies of the human psyche and the, the spiritual makeup that makes us work. And so this work can be studied on many different levels. Uh, it can be studied as a book of theology, of mysticism, of philosophy. It can be studied in a more intellectual way. But that's not the intent. That was not what it was written for. It's not a book that was written to be read uh, as a book and to be kept on the, on the coffee table or, or to be studied and compared with other, other books as a purely intellectual pursuit. If you read it carefully, you see that it is actually a book of meditations. It's a book of visualizations of thoughts that you can utilize to make your life more meaningful, to, to connect to a higher source. And so 
rather than study the book as a book, we're going to pick out little uh, points from the book and meditate on them. And the form of meditation we're going to use is one that the author of the Tanya, Rabbi Shneir Zalman, he pretty much started a new school of meditation, uh, which he called his boninus, his boninut in Hebrew, which means uh, contemplation. The idea is that you study a concept, an intellectual concept, and you understand it in your mind, but you don't leave it as a thought that you understand in your mind, but you bring it alive by marinating in it, by animating the thought, by bringing it to life and, and experiencing it in your mind. Because the power of the mind is that it can assimilate ideas from the outside. The weakness of the mind is that those ideas can remain aloof. They can remain as concepts, as theories. We very often read a book or hear a lecture and we're inspired by the ideas. And we go out inspired by it, but it doesn't necessarily move us to do anything, to change. We want to, we mean to, but it doesn't actually affect us. Rabbi Shneir Zalman explains the reason is because hitting your mind is not enough. It has to come down into your heart that you feel it. And that's a process. The mind is the, is the gateway. It all has to start through the mind, but from the mind it has to then come down into your heart to become a reality that you, that you interact with. And that, he says, the way to do that, the way to take an idea from the mind and bring it down to the heart, is what he calls it bonanut, which means contemplating deeply on the idea, visualizing it, bringing it alive, allowing it to sink in, making it so real that you can almost touch it. And then you start to react emotionally to it. You, f you start to feel it. So we're going to try and do that this evening. And the way we'll do it is by studying an idea from the Tanya, talking about it, explaining it, and then trying to see it uh, and actually live it. It should be noted that the, this school of meditation and the meditation that we're going to be doing is not really comparable to other meditation. I personally have never done any Eastern meditation myself. Uh, I have no experience in it at all. And this is not an attempt to imitate or compete with any other schools of, of, of meditation. Uh, it, it is a standalone method. And so those of you who have experienced Eastern meditation, uh, this is not, it, it may be the same, maybe not. It may have some similarities, it may, it may not. I actually would, don't know, you can tell me that. But it's certainly not an attempt to, to take an Eastern idea and fit it into a Jewish context. It's not that at all. This is authentic Jewish approach to meditation. It's, it's coming from our own tradition. Uh, and therefore, it's completely safe for the Jewish soul. There's no, there's no, there's no danger to it, that's, that's for sure. Uh, and, but also, it's, it gels more with the Jewish soul because it's coming from our, from our own internal tradition. So, so let's start with the idea. The idea that Rabbi Shnei Zalman teaches at the very beginning of Tanya, he starts his book of Tanya, which is a 53-chapter work of, of ideas and meditations. He starts the work with a quote from the Talmud. The Talmud is the compendium of Jewish wisdom that was committed to writing uh, in uh, around the, the six or seven hundred uh, of, the, of the common era, around the year six or seven hundred. And it is a, a compilation of wisdom teachings that came from, from the generations previously. And Rabbi Shnei Zalman chooses to begin his work with a quote from that. In fact, the word Tanya means it was taught by the rabbis of the Talmud. It's a, I'm about to quote the rabbis of the Talmud. That's, that's how he starts the work. What quote does he start Tanya with? He starts it with a section from the Talmud that is discussing the pre-birth experiences of a baby. That a, an unborn baby, while in the womb of the mother, its experience, what it's going through, is described in the Talmud. It says in the Talmud that while the baby's in the womb, the baby is being taught Torah. The entire time while it's in the womb, the, the baby is being taught Torah. There's an angelic being that is uh, communicating to the soul of the baby the wisdom of the Torah, the divine wisdom. That is, that is what a baby is, is, is uh, occupied with in the womb. It says there that there's a light that shines above the baby's head 
that allows this baby to see from one end of the world to the other while it's in the womb. And only before it leaves the, the, the mother, before it leaves the womb, an angel comes to touch this child on the lip and causes it to forget all that it studied in the womb. All the Torah wisdom that it had, all the vision that it had is forgotten. So it's, it's Im implanted with all this wisdom. It is then made to forget that wisdom and then it can be born. Then the baby can be born. However, and this is the part that Tanya directly quotes, the, before that baby can enter into the world, the soul of the child is made to make an oath, to swear that it will be a tzaddik and not a rasha. It will be a righteous person and not a wicked person. Before entering into the world, it has to promise, make an oath, it has to swear, the soul of the child has to swear that I will be righteous, I will not be wicked. And only then can the baby be born. So this section of Talmud, it gives a bit of an insight into what's going on in the womb, a fascinating insight, a spiritual insight, this, it, that it's studying Torah. What does it mean, studying Torah? Obviously, we're not talking about there's a, a study session going on. There's, there's not a, a, a teacher in a physical sense. We're saying that the soul of the child is being saturated with divine wisdom. The soul at this stage has not entered into the body. It's hovering over the body, which is the, the language of the Talmud, that there's a light shining above the head of the, of, the, of the baby. That light shining above the head is the soul that has yet to enter the body, but is hovering around the body and is receiving this light, this wisdom, this uh, depth of knowledge that will prepare that child for its life in this world. But then it's made to forget all that because this can't be given to you on a platter. It's implanted in the soul, but you have to regain it in your lifetime. That in this world, you have to study and you have to, you have to gain the, that wisdom. But it's been already implanted there. It's there like, like a familiar song that you heard once upon a time. It'll come back to you when you hear it down here in this world. It's implanted in the soul. So this is, this is what the, the, the unborn child is experiencing during those nine months. But then, says the Talmud, and this is the part that the Tanya starts with, it's made to make an oath. The soul has to make a promise. You're about to enter into the world, you have to promise you're going to be righteous and not wicked. You're going to do the right thing and not the wrong thing. Now, the Tanya then takes this statement and goes into a, a long and elaborate discourse into explaining what does it mean righteous, what does it mean wicked, uh, and, and to define these things. But before getting into any of that, it's worthy of just examining the quote that, 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 that the Tanya starts with. Tanya, it's taught that the, the soul is made to make an oath that it will be righteous and not wicked. Rabbi Shnei Zalman himself, as well as his children and grandchildren, spent a lot of time explaining this oath. If this is the beginning of Tanya, if this is the first line of Tanya, if the first thing you need to know when you open the book of Tanya is that your soul, before it came into the world, made an oath that it will be righteous and not wicked, then we have to understand this oath. This is very important. This is central. This is, this is fundamental to our spiritual life, that we've all made this oath. What does it mean to make an oath? And, and what meaning does this oath have that the soul makes? There are a few difficulties with it. Well, first of all, what is an oath? We, we, we I guess in our culture, we're not, we don't swear that type of swearing so much. Today, if you say somebody swears a lot, it means something completely different than makes a lot of oaths. So what, what does it mean to swear, to make an oath? Why would somebody make an oath? Why, why is there a need to make an oath? What is an oath? What's an oath for? Hmm? A promise, a commitment. And what difference does it make? If I, if I tell you something, 
or I swear to you something. What's the difference? It creates an intention, a deep, deep intention. That, that telling doesn't? If I say it, it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't do it? The level of commitment is deeper. Responsibility. More responsibility. So if I say I'm going to do it, maybe, maybe not. If I swear that I'm going to do it, I've got to do it. One is explicitly tying one's honor to the voluntary. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm putting my, my, my word, my, my honor on the line, my, my reputation on the line by swearing. Whereas if I just said it, I'm thinking of honor and fraud. Uh huh. Yeah. So, why should I keep my word anymore if I've made the oath or if I haven't made the oath? What actual practical difference is there? Is it, is it just the other person's expectation that I've changed? That people have heard the oath? Why is there any more of a chance that I'll keep my word because I made the oath? Is it, is it the oath connected to, to Hashem that you're, you're making an oath? Isn't that the, the whole concept of an oath is that um, it's you know, in the courts, you put your hand on, on the Bible. So it's connected to Hashem that you're, it's not just you talking, it's beyond you connecting to your, to the Creator. Mm -hmm. so it's, so you're invoking a divine power, not just your power, yeah. but the divine power on it. You're connecting to that. You're, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Is it like a neder? A neder is a form of oath, yeah. So what does that do? It's got strength. It's like you're tied your commitment to your, to your sense of righteousness, whatever that means to you as an individual and to your society. Mm -hmm. And so commitment by the soul to be righteous is is tautologically true. Mm -hmm. an obligation. Right. An obligation. obligation. So our normal understanding of an oath, and I believe this is what everyone's saying in, 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 in slightly different ways, is that I am I'm heightening my my obligation, my responsibility. If I said I'm going to do it, I should do it. I should keep my word. But if I made an oath, I'm formalizing that a bit more. I'm, exp I'm expressing it in more dramatic terms. I'm putting more out there. So I really have to do it. So I guess an oath is a bit more pressure on me, perhaps. A bit, a bit it just makes it more serious. And I'm the same person. My, my ability to fulfill my word is the same whether I made an oath or if I just said it. I, I can equally do it or, or not do it. I might, I might promise the impossible. It was impossible when I didn't promise it, and making a promise is not going to make it more possible. So if I promise you, I promise you that, that I'm going to come up with a million dollars in three days, I can promise, I can make an oath, I can swear, but can I do it? No more if I made the oath or I didn't make an oath. It, it, I have the same abilities, it's just that I've, if I've promised, if I've made an oath, if I've sworn on it, so then I'm more liable when it doesn't happen. That's what it seems. But Rabbi Shnei Zalman explained this oath, and, and generally oaths, a bit differently and, and a bit deeper. If we look carefully at the word used for, for administering an oath here, it says, mashbin oto, that the person, the soul that's about to come into the world is made to make an oath. The word in Hebrew is shavua. Shavua is an oath. And Rabbi Shnei Zalman says that the word in Hebrew shavua can also be read instead of mashbin oto, which means making the, the soul make an oath, you could read it masbin oto, which means to empower the soul. Masbin means to empower rather than to, to make an oath. And the word oath, the word oath in Hebrew means to draw down a power, to draw down an extra power. That, that when you make an oath, you're not just obligating yourself more, 
you're empowering yourself more to fulfill what you just said. You're tapping into a deeper power within yourself that will allow you to fulfill your word. That while generally speaking we operate with our faculties that are, are manifest, with our abilities that, that, we, that we know we have, there is an entire world beneath the surface of abilities, of powers, of faculties, of energies, of potentials that we have that have not been tapped into, that have not been utilized, that we haven't used. And we may not even be aware of them. Making an oath from a spiritual perspective means tapping into those powers, saying that I'm not just going to use the energies I know to fulfill my word, but I'm going to tap into energies that I didn't even know I had, deeper energies, and I'm going to utilize them. That I'm not just swearing it, I'm being empowered to do it. The Tzemach Tzedek was the grandson of the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shnei Zalman, who wrote Tanya. And he, in one, in one of his explanations on this line of Tanya, says that the word for oath, Shavuah, can also, is also connected to the Hebrew word Shiva, which means seven. And he explains that our soul is made up of three levels that are within our body and seven levels that are beyond our body. Ten levels altogether, three levels within the body, seven beyond the body. Without going into that in too much detail, what he means is that there's a part of our soul that inhabits our body that we have tapped into. We have our minds, our hearts, and our, our, our bodily functions that are all enlivened by our soul. But there is a greater part of our soul that is beyond being confined to the body, that is, that is, that is beyond us, that is bigger than us. And so your strengths that you have, that you're aware of, that's the soul that is within your body. The powers that are beyond what you're aware of, that you have, are beyond the body, and there's, there's much more, infinitely greater than what, than what you've tapped into. And so making an oath means that I'm going to tap into those powers that I haven't yet accessed to fulfill what, I've, what I have committed to do. And so an oath, therefore, is not just obligating me more, but it is empowering me more. By saying the words of an oath, there's a certain holy energy that I'm creating. I'm opening up something bigger than I knew that I had. And, and this, says Rabbi Shnei Zalman, is the meaning of the oath that our soul was, was made to make before we came into the world. It wasn't merely a promise that we were making. It was an empowerment that we were receiving. We were being given the power. What that means is that our soul before it came into this world was injected with powers, with energies and with strengths to face whatever situation we are going to face in our lifetime down here in this world. And the ability to face that situation and to come out on top. It's almost like before you've come into the world, before you've started your journey in, down in this world, you've already been given the tools to face whatever you're going to face in this world and you're able to face it, you're going to be able to do it. You have been empowered with the soul energy to face what you need to face. And that happened before you were born. The, the oath that you made, I'm going to be righteous, I'm not going to be wicked, what that means is I'm going to be faced with many challenges in my lifetime because every life, every soul that comes into the, this world has a whole array of challenges they're going to have to face. There's a whole list of things that this soul is going to have to go through in its lifetime. We sometimes feel as if these things are being thrown at us. You know, life is throwing stuff at us. As if, you know, we're, we're, we're going through things, this is happening, that's happening, and, and all this stuff is being thrown at me. And we're going through a difficult time, you know, the, what's, 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 what's life going to throw at me next? Nothing's thrown at us. We each have a particular path in this world, a path of challenges, of difficult times, of, of ups and downs and of hurdles that we need to go through in order for us to express our soul's power in this world. Only through those challenges do we tap into that inner strength. And so therefore we've been given the strength to face that, that particular challenge. 
We were already empowered before we came into the world. Uh, I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to make the good choice. I'm going to do the right thing in that, in that situation. I'm not going to be wicked. I'm not going to, not going to fall. I'm not going to fail. I'm going to, I'm going to be empowered. I am empowered to do this. So our soul has already been given that power before we were born. And that's, that's how this oath can actually make sense. Because if you think about it, for the soul to promise I'm going to be righteous makes no sense. The soul, our soul is righteous. Our not righteousness doesn't come from the soul. Our not righteousness comes from our body and our physical side that gets tempted to do the wrong thing. Our soul is pure. So why does the soul need to promise I'm going to be righteous? <laughs> the, the body is the one that needs to make that promise. How can the soul make a promise when it hasn't entered in the world yet? It hasn't faced its challenges yet. The promise is not just a promise, a commitment. The promise is an empowerment. We're being, we're being pumped with energy to face our problems. That is, that is the idea that Tanya begins with. And, and it is therefore an extremely, extremely powerful way to start the book of Tanya. To tell each one of us that whatever you're going through in your life, you were given the soul energy to face that and to make the right choice, to bring goodness out of that. Now, I want to just make one thing clear. This doesn't mean that you can do anything. This doesn't mean that all your dreams will come true. Whatever you want, you've been, you've been given the power to do it. Uh, no, not all your dreams will come true, which is probably good. Because some dreams, probably better if they don't come true. Uh, some dreams are, are silly or inappropriate or just off. They don't need to all come true. Not, not all dreams come true. It doesn't also mean that everything's going to be easy. Your life is going to be this smooth, easy path. N not at all. It's not saying that you've been given the power to do whatever you want. What it's saying is that whatever challenge you're given, you have the power to make the righteous choice, to do the right thing in, the, in that situation. And therefore, it's up to you to tap into that power and to use it. This is the, the introduction to Tanya. This is the first line of Tanya. So we can take that as a thought, as an idea. And it's a nice, encouraging idea that, that we've been given the powers to face our, our adversity in life. But the idea of Tanya is to try and visualize this idea and utilize it as a tool. Not, not when you're sitting here hearing it as, as, as a thought, but in life, in, in, in practical situations in life, when we're faced with those adversities, to not just remember the idea, but to actually live it, to, to bring it alive. So, so what I want to do is to try and visualize this thought of Tanya to make it into a tool that you can revisit uh, when it's needed. So, so the way we do this is we try and lose ourselves in the thought. We try and make the, th the thought take us over completely. So there is just the idea and nothing else. So the best way to do that is with eyes closed. So if you just sit comfortably in your seat and close your eyes and relax, there is always a risk of falling asleep. Sleep is also a form of meditation uh, and uh, it's also a soulful experience. Um, if you're worried that you'll fall asleep and therefore miss it, you can even do this standing up. There's no reason why you can't meditate standing up as well. It's rare for people to fall asleep standing up, um, in my experience. But, um, but if you just uh, relax yourself however you'd like, um, but the eyes closed is just to cut off from the visual reality around us to try and create a new, a new vision within ourselves. And just uh, breathe a little slower than you usually do. Breathing in through the nose, spending a few seconds on breathing in, and then breathing out gently.
And don't worry about any other sounds that are happening in the background. You can just incorporate them into, into your background without focusing or losing focus with them. And once the, the mind is calm, we can start a bit of an illustration in our mind. So, imagine yourself walking down a path, walking slowly, and the path can be anywhere you want, a windy path, and you're just walking at a steady, slow pace down the path. And coming your way from the opposite direction, there's a dark figure. that is blocking the path and coming towards you. This dark figure is a challenge that you're going through right now in your life. So, so identify in your mind the challenge can be a big issue, it can be a small one, it can be something you're going through some issue with a friend or a family member, it could be a health thing, something at work, something internally that you're struggling with. But just choose one for now. One, one thing that is keeping you up at night, that is not allowing you to relax, that is bothering you, disturbing you, hurting you, And that is personified by this dark figure that is coming towards you on this path, blocking your way. It's still a bit in the distance, but it's getting closer. And as it gets closer, you feel yourself slowly getting more tense more apprehensive because your path is blocked. And it's getting closer and closer now. And you're going to have to face this blockage on your path. So now, it's come face to face with you. And it's towering over you, it's surrounding you, it's in front of you that you can't get around. Your path is blocked. You're intimidated by it. So look at, look at how tall you stand and how tall this dark figure is standing in front of you. And you feel yourself starting to be enveloped by its darkness. And there's no way you can move on. You can't get past it. Your, your path is blocked.
But instead of losing hope, instead of cowering, shrinking, retreating, stand there for a moment, stare this black, dark figure in the eye, and think about the oath that before you were born, you were empowered with all the soul energy necessary to face this and every challenge. So God thought of this one too. This was a part of that empowerment. This has not been thrown at you. This is your, your path. And your path includes this dark figure. This is exactly where you're supposed to be. And this challenge is yours. And the power to overcome it is yours too. So let, let that thought sink in that this is not a mistake. This is not somebody else's fault. This is not my fault. This is my path. And this is where I'm supposed to be. And this challenge is mine. I was given the challenge and I was also given the power to face it, to overcome it, to be good in this challenge, to be righteous in this challenge. And so the apprehension that you had as this darkness was approaching you feel that apprehension melt away and you become calm standing in front of this challenge. So feel that that negative feeling, the fear, just feel it melt down out of your body. And it's replaced with a calm, with a resolve confidence so now you can stand in front of this black figure this dark figure without any fear And now, as you're standing there without any fear, feel yourself suddenly expanding, growing. Feel as if your body is getting taller, is expanding outward, is just proportionately bigger and bigger. But it's not because your body is getting bigger, it's that your soul is getting pumped from its source. That the soul inside you, the energy inside you, the strength that you have is expanding beyond its borders. So you feel lighter, you feel stronger, you feel that you have more strength behind you, more momentum. Your mind is working quicker.
And as, as you grow, as your soul expands, this dark figure in front of you is getting smaller by comparison. You're outgrowing it. And now you've grown to such a height, a, a spiritual height. The soul that is beyond you has now become within you. The soul energy that was hidden is becoming revealed. You're so strong now that you're looking down and seeing this dark opponent that was once bigger than you was once surrounding you but now it's a little a little thing there on the path that you can pick up and you can hold in your hands without any fear without any anger you can just lift it up And you can keep walking, walking along the path. Now, as you continue walking, you're taller. You're lighter. You're stronger. And you'll be ready for the next challenge, the next blockage. So just let yourself walk down the path further and slowly as you're walking, let the image fade away. When you're ready, open your eyes slowly. In Rabbi Shnei Zalman's community, back, back in Europe, there was someone known as Chaim de Kenner. Chaim was his first name. And those days they didn't have last names. Everyone had a nickname. A, some, some type of identifying thing. So, you know, like there was the, the tailor, was the Schneider. That's, that's Yiddish for tailor. There was uh, the short person who was called Klein. 
There was the large person who was called Gross. And they, you know, every, everyone had their, their last names. These days, those last names don't indicate. It's just like what we inherited. But back then, it was given to you. So there was Chaim de, de Kenner. De Kenner means the one who can. Chaim who can. How did he get the name Chaim who can? Because anything you asked him to do, he said, okay, I can do that. Anything, anything anyone asked him, he always said, I can, okay, I can. To the point where he became known as Chaim who can. Because he, he, always, he always can. You ask him a favor and he can do it. You ask him for a loan, yeah. Whatever you asked him. And he was always positive and always joyous. And this was in spite of the fact that he was actually a very poor man. Materially, he, he, didn't, he didn't have much. But if somebody asked him for a loan, he said yes. And, and he, he, he somehow scraped it together. Or if somebody needed his time, so he gave his time to whoever needed it. He always said, yes, I can, to everything. And people asked him, how do you do this? How is it? You, you, can always, you can always do it. You always can, and you, with a smile. You can do everything with a smile. So he said that he heard from the Alter Rabbi Rabbi Shnei Zalman, the author of the Tanya, the first line of Tanya, that before your soul comes into the world, you're empowered to be righteous in no matter what situation, to always do good, no matter what situation. You've been empowered to do it. That the oath that you were given must be an oath. So when it says that you were made to make an oath, it means you were empowered, you were given the power to do good in every situation that you're in. So the Alter Rebbe explained to me, that means that even you, no matter what circumstance you're in, and even though there's so many reasons why you could say, I can't do it, and you'd be justified in saying, I can't do it, and maybe really logically you can't do it, but you have a power in your soul that is much greater than you have tapped into yet, and the fact that you've been given opportunity to, to face this challenge means that you've also been given the power to. So you can. And he took this so seriously, this idea, that he believed it. He really believed it. So what, whatever circumstance he was in, he said, I can. And so he became known as Chaim who can, the Kenner. And, and this is something that, that all of our souls has experienced this. We, every soul before it came down, your soul, my soul, was told that you can. That you, you do have greater powers than you can imagine. It's like your soul is like there's the tip of the iceberg and then there's the big iceberg that's underneath the surface, inverted. There's like the soul that, that you know of yourself, the powers that you know you have. And with the powers you know you have, there are some situations where you can't. Like I've got only so many talents and so many abilities and I've got only so much patience and I've got only got so, so much ability to, to overcome and I'm in a situation where I'm out of my depth but that's looking at the tip of the iceberg that's only looking at the powers that, that you're aware of there are all these powers that your soul has been been invested in has, has been pumped with to face the situation that you are in now that you haven't yet explored and that was the promise that you made you made an oath that, that you'll be righteous in this situation, you'll do good in this situation, you'll do the right thing, and you'll be able to overcome whatever's blocking your path. So, so I think we can utilize that, that visualization when we feel that there's something blocking that, can't, that I can't get past. That analysis may be correct. That may be an accurate measurement. I cannot get past this looking at the tip of the iceberg. But being that there is a, an entire big iceberg that is beneath the surface, or in this case the soul that is above us, so then we have to tap into that as well. 
and then we can also be Chaim Kenner, Chaim who can. Okay, any questions? Is that related to the um, the story about everybody has two packages when they're born? Yeah, that's another that's another uh, illustration of it that that we're each, we're each given two suitcases. Our soul is packed with two suitcases before you're born. One suitcase has all of the difficulties and blockages and challenges that that you're going to face in your lifetime. That is preordained. This is your path. And there's another suitcase that has all the abilities, the talents, the strengths to overcome the challenges in the other suitcase. And so some people have two very heavy suitcases that they come into this world with. Uh, if we look around, some people seem to have a lot of stuff that they go through. I mean, just comparing, you can never compare people, but it just seems that some people, one thing after the other, like to just have all these difficulties. And when you're in that situation, you think, so God must be picking on me, like letting it all out on me. I'm the one who has to have all these all these issues, because then you look at other people who seem to coast through life and have it easy. But that's because this soul has so many energies. It's, it's got so much to give, to contribute. And for some reason, the structure of this world is the only way we really utilize our energies is when we're challenged. If we're not challenged, then we don't tap into anything deeper. So some souls are given a heavy suitcase of challenges because they have so many talents and gifts that they have to bring to the world. So it's not a punishment, it's, it's, a, it's a sign of a very powerful, strong soul. And those other people that look like they have it easy, it's usually because you just don't know them so well. They look like it has it easy, because they have their things as well. But it definitely is true that, that some people go through a lot of bigger stuff. But isn't it interesting that they're not necessarily the most miserable people you know. In fact, often on the contrary, that sometimes those people who have, who have gone through all that, that stuff are the most positive and uh, um, elevated people, inspiring people. And sometimes those people who seem to have it quite easy are not necessarily all that all that are uplifting because one has a brighter soul and more, more energy they couldn't handle anymore those people so yeah we have we have those two suitcases okay thank you we'll end it there god willing next week we'll do another one thank you